We all know radar is a way of detecting distant objects. We also know it uses energy to do this. But how exactly does it work? What kind of things can be done with radar to make it useful? With modern computers to process radar results, we can do a lot like look at weather patterns or find distant objects in the air or even in space. But before we go into that, I thought it would be a good idea to get a basic understanding of how radar waves work first. So let's dive in. At its core, radar works on the principle that radio waves are reflected off of objects. Some materials are especially reflective to these radio waves, like most metals. But just about everything can reflect these waves to some degree. This means it's possible to illuminate a distant surface with radio waves and see it just like if you were shining a big searchlight on it. In fact, if you think of radar like a searchlight, it'll help in understanding its properties because radar waves share a lot in common with light. So far you've heard me use radar and radio waves interchangeably. That's because they're exactly the same. They're both electromagnetic waves. The only difference is how they're used. In fact, the waves generated by a microwave oven are also the same. This was something discovered by Percy Spencer in the 1940s, who noticed a chocolate bar in his pocket melted while he was working on a radar emitter for the military. He would later go on to patent the microwave oven. Those same electromagnetic waves can be used for different purposes. So let's take a look at how they're generated. Whether you're transmitting a radio broadcast or a radar signal, one of the easiest ways to do it is with a simple antenna like this monopole antenna. When you run an electrical current up this antenna, it'll radiate electromagnetic waves that follow the current upward. Then if you reverse the polarity, the same will happen in the opposite direction. If you keep doing this, then you'll generate a pattern with peaks and troughs. These waves appear with the frequency that matches how fast you're switching the polarity. We measure that frequency by counting how many times a wave passes a point in space per second. One wave per second is one hertz and a million waves per second is one megahertz. The size of the antenna also affects how well it broadcasts or receives these waves. Most modern radar systems will use a component called a magnetron to generate these radar waves instead of a simple monopole antenna. The waves it creates are exactly the same, and just like a monopole, the size matters. The volume of these cavities determines the wavelength of the emitted waves. When we talk about radar reflections, what's actually happening is the radar imparts an electrical current on a surface it comes into contact with. Then as that charge moves along the surface, it generates a new wave, just like our transmitting antenna. We'll dive into this a little deeper in a future video. For now, we want to focus on the waves themselves. All radar waves have an electrical component and a magnetic component, which is why they're also called electromagnetic waves. You'll always find these fields at 90 degrees to each other, and the direction the electrical field faces is called its polarization. In this case, it's vertically polarized since the electric field is oriented up and down. But if it were rotated 90 degrees, it would be horizontally polarized. Since all EM waves travel at the same speed, which is just below the speed of light within the Earth's atmosphere, then changing the frequency of these waves also affects how far apart each peak is. That distance is known as the wavelength. At 300 megahertz, the wavelength is one meter, and at 300 kilohertz, it's one kilometer. So we can see that as frequency goes up, wavelength goes down. It's important to know about frequency and wavelength because radar waves interact with the world differently depending on the length of the wave. EM frequencies are organized into groups called bands. There are different naming conventions out there for these bands, but two of the more popular ones are from the IEEE and NATO. This first scale was created in World War II to give names for radar frequencies. Later on, NATO would create this second scale, which makes it a little more intuitive to identify the frequency at a glance. Lower frequencies are less affected by weather than higher frequencies. Fog and rain absorb radar energy and weaken its power. That's because the wavelengths of higher frequencies are closer in size to raindrops and water particles, which means they interact with them more closely. Here we can see that these lower bands have much lower attenuation than the higher bands. Below about 3 GHz there isn't much effect. So when these frequencies are transmitting in bad weather, they're more likely to get through. But even in clear weather, we see that the higher frequencies are heavily attenuated just by the atmosphere. So less of their power will make it through at longer distances. Once you get to the really high frequencies, their range can be as short as a few meters. 
Looking at this chart, you may be wondering then, why would we ever use higher frequencies? To answer that, we need to look at how our waves travel through the air. Here we can see another antenna. In this case, it's a dipole because it has two ends as opposed to a single one like the monopole we looked at earlier. As our antenna radiates, we see that the waves aren't two-dimensional. They're actually big three-dimensional waves, kind of like big bubbles. So when we increase frequency, the wavelength shrinks. And when we decrease frequency, that wavelength grows larger, which also makes the bubble larger. When we get a return echo from one of these big bubbles, we don't actually get much information besides the fact that there was something reflective somewhere inside that bubble. So if that wave was a mile wide, then that could be anywhere within a mile wide segment of the world. That might be enough to get a rough idea of where an aircraft is, but not enough to get good precision on it. Like if you needed to guide a missile towards it, or if you wanted to identify it by its shape. Higher frequencies produce smaller waves, which will give you that better resolution. It's just like how higher resolution on a monitor gives you smaller pixels on the screen. This resolution is called angular resolution. When we're talking about the equivalent of pixels in your radar, we mean how wide those pixels are in azimuth. This is important because if multiple objects appear inside one of those resolution cells, like aircraft flying in close formation, then they'll appear as just a single return. But as we discussed earlier, this extra resolution comes at the cost of range. There's also another factor that affects the range of radar detection. As energy radiates away from the emitter, it spreads out over a wider area the further it gets from the emitter. It looks like this. Let's say we have a hypothetical radar with 9 watts of power, and each watt is represented by a red line. At a certain range, all 9 watts fit into this square of space. But when we go out to twice that range, those 9 watts are now spread across a volume that covers four of those same size squares. So each square gets only 2 or 3 watts of radar energy. Now if we go out even further to 3 times that range, now we see that a volume of 9 squares is still getting energy. But none of those squares is receiving more than 1 watt of energy. The same holds true for reflected energy. It'll get scattered and weaker on the way back. So if this radar station needed a minimum of 1 watt to see a target, then it would only be able to detect targets in this region between ranges 1 and 2. But this radar energy out here doesn't just vanish. It can still be received by other sources, even if the emitter can't do much with it. Let's take a look at an example. Here we have two fighter jets pointing their radars at each other. But this MiG-29 doesn't have a return yet on the F-16 because it's too far away to receive the minimum amount of power for detection. However, from the F-16's point of view, we can see that it is receiving a radar signal from the MiG-29. In this case, the F-16 pilot has received some useful information from the MiG-29's radar, even though the MiG-29 still hasn't gotten any meaningful returns. This dilution of power is known as an inverse square law, and it affects all radiated energy. Another factor that affects range is specific to low-frequency radars. At these lower frequencies, radar waves are reflected by the layer of ionized air in the atmosphere known as the ionosphere. So they can travel over terrain that would otherwise block the signal and reflect back from objects at an even longer distance. They can also bounce up off the surface and may potentially interfere with return echoes. These extra returns are known as multipath echoes, and they can cause ghosts to appear in a pattern like this. So it's something that builders and operators of radar systems need to account for. These lower frequencies can also be diffracted around obstacles because of their long wavelength. This phenomenon is known as a ground wave, and it also allows these signals to travel farther. You'll find high frequency radars in aircraft and missiles, not just because of the issue with low frequencies, but because of antenna size. Low frequency radars have a high wavelength so they need larger antennas that may not easily fit into the nose of a fighter or a missile. But they aren't problem-free. High-frequency radars are stopped by obstacles like man-made structures and terrain. This means that after a certain distance, the curvature of the Earth actually blocks the radar signal. Let's take a look at an example of this. If a radar system is at a height of 20 feet and is searching for an aircraft at an altitude of 5,000 feet, 
then it will have a line of sight on that aircraft at 80 nautical miles. Anything flying below this aircraft will be hidden away in this radar shadow. What if that same aircraft was flying at 250 feet? It wouldn't emerge from the radar shadow until 21.5 nautical miles. That's almost 60 miles closer. So you can see why low-level tactics are popular among military pilots that want to elude radar. Of course, increasing the height of the radar changes the equation. If we lift that radar up to 20,000 feet, it can now see that low-flying plane at 167 nautical miles. This is why AWACS aircraft are such a powerful asset. So far we've talked about the properties of different radar frequencies, but we haven't gone over how those radar waves are turned into useful information for a radar operator. There are a few things we can do to make our radar emissions more useful. For example, with this emission pattern we could get a reflection on an object here, which we could capture with the receiver antenna here. But this arrangement would give us a problem. All we would see on our receiver is a spike in energy, and that spike would look exactly the same if it came from an object that was here, or even here. So we need a way to shape our radar waves so we don't cover such a wide area. A common way of doing this is with a directional antenna, like a dish. This way we can steer our energy, and if we get a return, then we know the azimuth to that return. But this method isn't perfect. Because radar travels in waves, it doesn't stick to a neat straight line pattern. Some of that energy goes off to the side and even behind the emitter in a pattern that looks like this. This main cone is known as the main lobe. These smaller offshoots are side lobes, and anything behind the emitter is a back lobe. We have to be careful with these because they can give us returns we may not want. This radiation pattern also presents another challenge. As it scans its surroundings, it'll pick up aircraft within its main and side lobes, but there's going to be a gap in coverage above the radar site itself. Because this area is shaped like an inverted cone, it's known as the cone of silence. Any aircraft overflying the radar won't show up for the operator. So it's common to see radars deployed with overlapping coverage to take care of each other's blind spots. There's an additional problem with this setup. When we're continuously emitting waves like this, we only know the direction of a return. So we have to do something extra with our emissions if we want to get additional data, like the range and speed of a target. There are some techniques to help with this, like pulsing our emissions and measuring Doppler shift. We'll go over both of these topics as we continue this series. The ultimate goal here is to explain the fundamentals of EW in modern air combat. So later on, we'll go over different methods for countering detection like stealth and jamming. And we'll also talk about how IFF lets us identify aircraft. But first, we'll need to understand how radars work, which is why we're covering that in the first few videos. I hope you found this useful, and thanks for watching.